This is the Holland Assets Podcast, where we show you how to start and run your own trucking company. Ever wanted to go out on your own? Follow Chris as he goes through the highs and lows of running on his own authority. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Holland Assets Podcast. Today, it is episode... Number 50. 50. Woo. Holy smokes. So this is, it, it's a milestone. It Chris. is a milestone. It's a so, big deal. So welcome. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. I am Craig. I'm here with Chris in studio for the first time in a while. And yeah. uh, how are you feeling? Dude? I'm, I'm feeling good. I haven't caught the COVID, so I'm feeling pretty good so I far. I mean, not, not yet. So Not we'll, yet. We'll yeah. see how that goes. We'll keep I, it away. Uh, we are all sitting six feet apart. And I say all because we have a third person in studio today. Chris, do we want to introduce him now or later? Um, in a minute. Okay, in a minute. All right, all right. Yeah, he's going to sit there quietly in the corner. <laughs> Keep that hat on. It's fine. Okay, so today's topic, we, we kind of introduced this last week a little bit. Uh, last week, we talked about your philosophy behind hiring employees. And it was, it was pretty high level kind of overview stuff. Today, we're going to be diving into a very specific topic within this umbrella. And that is uh, whether you classify an employee as an employee or as a, a contractor, right? Or, you know, something, yep. whatever the language is that we're going to learn throughout the course of this episode. Uh, Chris, introduce this to us. Tell us what we're going to be getting into today. So I think one one way to really kind of nail this one down, at least to just introduce it really quickly, is um, employee and independent contractor. A lot of times in the trucking industry, you see guys use this as kind of just a label. And, and this is so much more than a label. Um, I don't know if you've heard this phrase before, but it's really common in the military. I hear it all the time, but um, the, people often say that words have meaning, right? And so I think this is a perfect example of where these two words, employee and independent contractor, have very big meetings, meanings. And, and I want to kind of use an example from my military experience. Um, let's talk a little bit about radio protocol. So when you're in the military, you have to use specific words and specific terms when you're speaking on the radio so everybody has a clear understanding of exactly what it is you're saying and exactly what it is you're meaning meaning so when you want somebody to repeat what they've said you don't use the word repeat you say say again and the reason behind that is because in the artillery world you know the guys that shoot the big guns that mm -hmm. make big bangs repeat means to do what you just did over again so if you're on the radio and you know an, an artillery guy's listening and you say hey repeat that you know wanting somebody to repeat what they said he may say oh you want me to repeat what i just did and so you know he may have just fired a bunch of artillery rounds on somewhere and he, he hears repeat that to him means okay do that again and um, you could have just caused a big problem because in that time, people could have moved into the area. You know, they may not have been ready for it. And so you, you really have to be careful about what you say. And, and because those specific words have very specific meanings. And that's the same thing with this employee and independent contractor. There is a very big difference. A lot of people aren't super familiar with it. So in this episode, um, we've brought in ryan an attorney that specializes in this and he's going to kind of break it down really easy I've, I've heard him speak before in the past and he he does a really good job of taking this complicated subject and breaking it down into something that's easy for a dummy like me to understand okay well ryan welcome thank you want to introduce here. yourself a little bit i do so ryan nelson i am an employment law attorney been practicing for about 15 years I am the Utah president of Employers Council. Now, Employers Council is an association for employers, like uh, a trucking association or a manufacturing association. And we provide employment law support, service, and resources to employers of all shapes and sizes. All right. So you are here because you know it's, it's the old thing about um, if you know something really, really well, then you can start to teach it. And so as an employment attorney, you know, now we finally have somebody who's uh, able to answer the question of employer or employee versus uh, uh, contractor, independent contractor, and whether whether one is better for a trucking company um, or, you know, whether for the company or for the employees and all that stuff. So we're going to get into all that. Uh, good. So, Chris, how do we how do we want to kick off this topic with Ryan? Do you have a, a question you want to start with? 
Yeah, it seems to me, Ryan, that most companies kind of get into trouble when they classify a an individual as an independent contractor versus an employee. Is that correct? So this idea of the label, to use your analogy, is this person an, an employee or an independent contractor? There is a tremendous amount of of misunderstanding about that. And to your point, the words matter. So yeah, there, there is. It's a common occurrence. We find it all the time. We find it with employers of all shapes and sizes who they think they can just affix a label to a relationship and that the label determines the outcome, which is not correct. It's, it's a bit more complicated than that. So what does that mean? Like the, they think the label creates a certain outcome. What, um, what does that mean exactly? They think that by saying somebody is an independent contractor, then they have carte blanche to pay them a certain way or treat them a certain way. But if they're getting, if they're, if they're treating them as Y, but they're getting X, then they could run afoul of, uh, you know, basically giving them the wrong label. Yeah. Legally. Yeah. So when I say that an individual is an independent contractor, and so I put that label on the relationship, what I'm doing as the employer is I'm saying, okay, this relationship that we have is not an employee situation. And because I'm using the label independent contractor, I'm now going to treat you as an independent contractor. For example, I don't pay you overtime. In fact, I don't pay you wages. I pay you a contracted amount. And you have certain liberal uh, freedoms and I have certain freedoms. In other words, it's like a business to business arrangement. And but, but what I mean by the, the label and putting a label on that is, so if I say independent contractor, I'm then going to act in a certain way and do certain things, but the label itself isn't what controls the outcome. And that's where most companies get sideways, is they think, I'm just going to choose, and I pick independent contractor. And because I've chosen chosen that, therefore, everything else that I'm going to do is okay. But that's the misunderstanding, is you can't just pick the label and make it so. Got it. Got it. So if, if you label somebody as an independent contractor, how do you prove that they're an independent contractor? Do you have to prove it? Or what's the, what's the, the process for showing that, hey, this guy is an independent contractor? If you can't just say, hey, what, wave your magic wand, you are an independent contractor. What, what needs to happen there? Yeah, great question. So in employment law, when a company makes a decision and an independent contractor is just one example of many that when I make a choice as the employer, the burden of demonstrating that I've done it correctly is on me. I have to prove that. In other words, again, the label doesn't control, the designation doesn't control, it's what's actually happening with the circumstances. If I choose to use an independent contractor, and there are a variety of tests, both under federal law and state law, that determine what is, indeed, an independent contractor, I have to comply with those tests. If, for example, unemployment's a big deal right now. We have 39 million people apparently unemployed and on the state unemployment rolls throughout the U.S. In order for me to claim unemployment, there's a process that I have to follow. I have to qualify and be eligible for the unemployment. And an agency looks at that and makes an assessment. Same analogy is true with an independent contractor. If I designate an individual as an independent contractor, the unemployment division actually has a test that they look to and if an employee says, hey, I've received money from this company, but I'm an independent contractor, what the unemployment division is going to do is turn around and go to that company and say, hey, this person says this is an independent contractor relationship, prove it. It's on you to demonstrate that you've met our test in order to qualify for the privilege, if you will, of having an independent contractor relationship. So in this situation, you know, the whole innocent and prudent until proven guilty thing goes out the window and you're, it's the opposite. You're yeah. guilty and you got to prove that you're innocent. It's well, flipped on its head. It really is. And it's, it's, it's strange because these types of claims are administrative. They're not litigation. It's not in a courthouse, state or federal. It's an administrative claim where we're dealing with an agency and again, the agency looks at this as the cost of doing business with us is you get to prove that you're doing it right. 
And if you're not doing it right, then we levy a penalty or consequence. So the default then, when a company pays someone, the default designation would be employee. Exactly. But you gotta prove otherwise then. Exactly. Okay. And in, even within the employment relationship, so you're an employee, there's default designations within that relationship, like non-exempt, I am paid hourly and I'm entitled to overtime. That's the default designation for an employee status. Okay, okay, so what kind of, um, are there specific tests or, or requirements that people can go look up to see what questions uh, these agencies would ask, you know, how they prove it one way or the other? Yeah, there's not per se a list of questions, but there are a variety of tests. You have within every state, uh, several agencies that have a test you have internally here within the state, you have a wage hour division and there's a wage hour test. You have the unemployment division and there's an unemployment version of the test. You have federal law, the Fair Labor Standards Act and the wage and hour division. They have a test. You have the IRS. They have a test. So, and this is where it gets really funky for an employer is you're doing business within a state which has a variety of tests and agencies that enforce those tests. You're also doing business because you're in the U.S. under federal law, and you have a variety of federal law tests. They're all a little different, but they all generally focus on the same thing. They just use different words. But the tests are looking at the relationship, the control or the uh, level of control over the behavior, and also the relationship between uh, the parties in terms of risk, uh, frequency of use, reliability, stuff like that. So as, as you're talking about this, it's making me want to zoom out <laughs> and say, okay, now we need to actually define for the purposes of our conversation what an employee or a, a contractor is, an independent contractor. And kind of what I'm hearing is something along the lines of, uh, okay, so so Chris tells me, hey, we need to make X number of podcasts a month, um, and that's the deliverable. Here's the thing that we have to make, um, and it's up to me how to do that, when to do that, et cetera, et cetera. If it were a, a, a type of thing where Chris said, okay, every Monday morning at nine o'clock, your butt is going to be in that seat, and we're going to be, you know, uh, creating these things, making these deliverables, then we're drifting into he's requiring like the way that I'm doing my work or something. Is this yeah. how we're getting into the the employee versus contractor? Yes. yes. So there's a great analogy that we've talked about just briefly in our last conversation that I'll, I'll use today when, when we're ready for it. But what you've just given as an example is behavioral control. And so if we look at the IRS test, they have this behavioral control characteristic, and that is who's telling the independent contractor what to do. And if, in your example, your butt will be in the chair at this time, we're going to be working for this long, we will be t focusing on this, that, and the other, and here's how you're going to do it, here's how I want you to do it, here's the outcomes, here's the way I want you to do it. What we've done is, instead of a business-to-business -business type relationship, where both parties come at the situation with certain expertise and exp expectations, we've modified that where and again, your example is, is almost like a boss telling the employee what to do, when to do it, how to do it, why to do it. This takes us right back to the label question at the very beginning. The label isn't determinative, the relationship is. And in your example, those characteristics of the relationship, you're telling someone who, again, we've labeled as an independent contractor, but you're telling him or her, you're not really independent because I'm in charge. When you have characteristics in the relationship like that, that's what leads an agency to conclude, yeah, we really have an employee relationship, notwithstanding your label, because of how you're treating each other. Mm. So, yeah, Chris, take it away. So, you look so like from, you had something to say. Yeah, from your previous, the previous conversation that we've had, Ryan, we you, you've mentioned that you, the federals, and you've said this before, that the feds have kind of their tests, the states kind of have their tests, but the federal has, you know, for the most part, uh, an 11 factor test that kind of helps determine whether um, the person is an independent contractor, an employer. 
And and you used an analogy that I really really love where you talk about a sliding scale. Mm -hmm. And these are the you know so these are the scales like you remember gym class Craig when you had to step on a scale and it had a weight on it you had to move it a, you know right or the left and, I'm sorry, and get it uh, to balance. I've completely blocked that yeah, from my you, memory. You, you didn't weigh you, <laughs> you didn't weigh anything back back when you were in high school. I, I still don't. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, let's let's kind of go move a little bit into that that eleven factor test and how that all fits in with the sliding scale. So. Everybody picture that sliding scale. If you don't remember from gym class or from the doctor's office when you had to step on one of those, I actually in the show notes, I'm going to put a picture of a sliding scale so you can, <laughs> That's you can think about it. Go back and look at the show notes. I like that. So the, the 11 factor test that you're referring to is the IRS test. And the IRS, frankly, is one of the agencies most likely to catch an employer with a misclassification. You're, you're in frequent communications with the IRS through reporting mechanisms, filing your annual taxes. So the odds are better that if you've misclassified someone, the IRS is potentially going to catch that. Another is the unemployment division within the state where the company is doing business, especially in times like these. So this 11-factor test, it breaks it down into three parts, behavioral control, financial control, and then the relationship, the type of relationship between the worker and the employer. So the sliding scale example, you're standing on the scale and what you need to envision is that the weight is in the middle of the scale. On one side, you have the employee side. On the other, you have the independent contractor. And what we do is we go through a test like this, and this is my analogy, there's not a court per se that looks at it like this. This is just the way I've thought through it and, and like to explain it. But as we look at each of these different factors, when we conclude and after we evaluate a factor and we conclude, okay, this means it's more like an employee or like the independent contract, then you move that weight one side or the other. As you evaluate each of the characteristics, the weight should be moving to one side. And if you've done it properly, you can move it toward that independent contractor side and, from my perspective as a defense attorney, successfully defend your decision to label that relationship as an independent contractor. Where companies get in trouble is they place too much weight, for example, on one particular factor to the exclusion of others. These types of tests are a holistic approach. We're looking at the relationship in its entirety not just one or two factors. We're looking at all of them and then again making this assessment of where on the spectrum does this relationship end up. And so, okay, so let's walk through these 11 and the 11 factors, we're going to put those uh, up in the show notes yeah, as well. Yeah, they're, right? they're all in the show notes so you'll be able to look at them there um, and, and and we'll just kind of briefly touch on them. We're not going to go into any, in, in, into any big detail Um Ryan, last time we talked, you used a, another analogy with a plumber, and that was a really good example. So, you know, uh, most people understand plumbing and and hiring a plumber to do a job, mm -hmm. and so um, we can kind of go through all or part of these. We don't necessarily have to touch every last one of them, but we can go through enough of them to at least kind of get people the idea of, you know, how how the question gets answered and how that shifts that scale one way more towards the employee or one or, or more towards the independent contractor. And, yeah. and this is where I get to do my plug. Go to hollandassetsllc.com for full show notes. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 was, that was pretty good. You guys practiced in that. Silky? Yeah. yeah, yeah was silky good? Okay. All right. that, was, that was well done. Thank you. Smooth. Thank you. Okay. Take it away, Ryan. All right. So you gave an example of butt in a chair, doing this at this time in this manner. Mm -hmm. That's one of the key characteristics of behavioral control. Okay. So instructions that the business gives to the worker, what are those? And do they look like an independent relationship or do they reflect more of what an employee relationship looks like? Your example, more like an employee. Independent contractor is going to look very, very different. And so at this point, let me talk about the plumber example. We've all interacted with perhaps some type of a professional, and I like to use the plumber example. Um, I have a variety of pipes and faucets and fixtures in my home. Something breaks and there's water leaking and I can't fix it. I don't have the tools. I don't have the training. I don't have really, I just don't know how to do it. And so I go out into the market to try and find someone 
who is an expert, who does have the tools, the licensing, the credentials, the experience, and advertises that. So a couple key points there. I'm, I'm looking for someone who is a business. They advertise in the community. They have everything that they need, and I can connect with them. The plumber shows up. He doesn't tell me, or I, excuse me, I don't get to tell him, hey, I'm available Monday at 9 a.m. You will be here. No, it's not how that works. He comes when his or her schedule permits. So there's an aspect of behavioral control right there. The plumber shows up when it's convenient for that individual because he or she is independent and is running their own business. Plumber shows up and I point him or her in the direction of the, the problem. He or she goes and does the work, brings his or her own tools, training, has licensing, probably pulls up in a van with branding and labels and, and licensed, bonded, and insured stuff on the side of it. I point the person in the direction of the project, the project is completed, and the contractor hands me a bill. I don't provide tools for the, the plumber. I don't stand over the plumber's shoulder and say, hey, no, I don't think you did that right. You ought to do it this way. I don't do really anything other than pay, and then we separate. I may never see that plumber again. The plumber could go across the street and work for my neighbors. I could bring the plumber back to do more work. It just depends on my needs, but there's a, there's a lot of great tidbits in this relationship, in that example about what an independent contractor relationship really looks like. I think, frankly, that that's one of the easiest and the ideal independent contractor relationship. And the behavioral control piece, I'm not telling the plumber what to do. I'm not telling the plumber how to do it. I'm not providing a mandate about when or why or how because that individual is independent. And that's a key characteristic of the behavioral control, for example. Now, the second part, financial control, this looks to the right to control the business aspects of the job. So in this instance, the plumber shows up. He's driven his own van, pays for his own gas, pays for his own tools, pays for his own supplies, pays for his own advertising. I don't reimburse him for any of that. It's all included in the cost of doing business with that individual. And I get one invoice, for example, that says you owe me a hundred bucks, parts, labor, thank you. Uh, and presumably... <laughs> How many plumbers have you hired again? Well, Tell me. <laughs> a couple, but again, simple analogy. <laughs> yeah, keep, let's keep it simple. So I, I get that bill and that's it. Now, the plumber, as an independent business, should have factored in the value of his or her time, the value of the mileage, and the cost of doing business. If it, he's running a good business, then he's probably going to make a profit. But if he underbids or quotes me and is wrong, the plumber bears the cost of that, not me. So if the plumber quotes me 50 bucks and ends up spending $200 in time and labor and materials, that's not my problem. That's the plumber's problem. So there's another aspect of financial control. The business, the independent contractor, bears the risk of doing business, not me. And so those are the two, okay, the first two aspects. We've got behavioral control and financial control. You said there was a third category. Yeah, this is just type the type of relationship between the business and the worker. And this is, I guess you could say it's a catch-all. Factors that we would look to, for example, is there a written agreement between the independent contractor and the employer? Uh, do we provide the employee or the independent contractor with employee-like benefits? Do we reimburse for mileage or expenses? Do we provide paid time off? Um, another example, and this one I think is, is, is fairly often overlooked, and that's the, the permanency of the relationship. I've seen situations where a, quote, independent contractor pretty much works full-time all the time and for years for the same company as a, again, independent contractor. Well, there's a permanency within that relationship that contradicts an independent contractor status. Employees come every day to work and stay for longer periods of time. Independent contractors don't necessarily. They come when there's work, they do the work, they leave. 
So, and, so let me kind of take a step back and ask a question here to kind of to kind of clarify. So it seems to me like this plumber relationship that that I mean, if you look at the scale, it's pegged clear over on the independent contractor side. I mean, agreed. there's not there's like nothing moving that scale over to the employee piece, right? So and and that doesn't necessarily have to be the situation to be able to classify somebody as an independent contractor, right? I agree. So take, for example, say, you know, in those 11 factors, they, they're, they're an independent contractor in all of them, except for let's, let's take, for example, that last one that you mentioned where the permanency, say that relationship, it is permanent and it's, it, and it's stay, you know, it stayed that way for years. You're working for the same, doing work for the same company, the same individual that that's moved that scale a little bit more towards the employee side, but it's still pretty far over on the independent contractor side. So you'd still probably in that kind of a situation be okay to have that person as an independent contractor. Is that fair enough to say? It is. It is. And here's another example of, of a way in which the weight could move from peg to the independent contractor side to a little bit towards the employee side. The, the plumber doesn't advertise or perhaps isn't an incorporated business, doesn't have the licensing or the bonded or insured status, but still has all of those other trappings of that relationship that I described. So yeah, maybe it's not per se a registered legitimate business, but it's still a contracting party doing business with another party. And most of the other aspects of the independent contractor relationship are there. Good. So what you kind of really want to boil it down to is, is you want to get that, you don't want to be in the middle ground. Like if you're trying to label somebody or, or have them as an independent contractor, you don't want half of the items on one side and half of the items on the other, because then it gets really hard to, to defend. You just want to get that scale moved over as far as you can to that independent contractor side. And that's what kind of protects you as an employee. Yeah, yeah, I- indeed. Um, and let me sharpen the stick on that example, because I've heard many times a company will say, well, this individual, the independent contractor, requested that we designate the person as an independent contractor. And so we're just doing what the person wants. And my response to that is again, okay, well, great. That's really benevolent of you, but do they meet the test? Well, I don't know. What should we be looking for? Well, is the person a business? No, we, we pay them just John Doe on the check. Okay, do they advertise? No. They used to work for us. What do they do? Well, they used to do the same thing. And now you've just, again, flipped a switch and designated them as an independent contractor because that's what the individual wanted. Yeah, that's what we did. So problematic all over on that one. Uh, and another example of, of something similar to that is, again, the employee or the individual requests it and we get into a conversation with the employer and say, okay, if you really want to do this, here's how you do it right. Find out business do they advertise? Do they have a website? Do they have business cards? Uh, you need an agreement. Uh, you should require that they are a registered entity within the state. And the employer looks at us and says, well, I don't want to ask them all that stuff. That's, that's none of my business, right? Well, if you want to be able to defend that they are indeed a, an independent contractor, those are characteristics that'll be your burden to prove as you try and justify that relationship. So as you're talking through this, uh, words that I'm hearing you use, you defend yourself, you know, protect yourself in, you know, in this designation of mm-hmm. independent contractor. What it sounds to me like is, boy, I really want to classify somebody as an independent contractor. I just got to justify that. But I'm not sure if that's what we mean to say, or maybe it is. Do we want to get into the question yet of whether you should want to, uh, you know, if you're hiring somebody for your trucking company, I mean, that's specifically what we're going after here. Do we want to get into whether you should be going for that designation or, uh, Chris, do you want to say that and put it on tenterhooks? No, I, I think we, let's, let's start answering that question right now. One, one thing that I kind of want to clarify with that before we get into it is, is one, you know, Ryan typically represents employers. So mm-hmm. this is what he does. And he has a lot of experience in the trucking industry representing, you know, trucking companies, working for trucking associations, advising. So he knows the trucking industry. Um, one thing that I want to, you know, kind of let's move into that now is a lot of the times for employers, it's 
beneficial to label somebody as an independent contractor. Absolutely. But just because it's beneficial to you doesn't mean you legally can do that or should do that. So, so what what makes it beneficial? Is it because you don't have to pay the the, uh, the taxes you, you and the have, benefits and yeah, all that? There's a lot of, I mean, it, essentially that entire cost of that relationship becomes a business expense. It simplifies a lot of things. It's just it's it's easier to do. But in the trucking industry, it gets done incorrectly all the time. And and I just want to just throw it out there one one question right now that just kind of I think in my opinion breaks this wide open is in in your opinion you know you've got all those tests and those factors that we have to do go through can somebody be labeled as an independent contractor if they don't own the truck they drive maybe and that's a cough out legal answer <laughs> because <laughs> i saw that coming from a mile away i was on a webinar or listening to a webinar at noon and and one of the attorneys responded with well it depends and i thought you cop out <laughs> answer the dang question so Maybe. And and what I mean by maybe is this. So again, you've got all of these factors we're looking to. One of the key factors in this relationship of independent status, and you've brought up the truck example. So the contracting employer provides the vehicle, the means by which all of the work is basically done aside from someone who pilots the vehicle. And when I provide you with the vehicle, I'm also probably requiring some form of maintenance schedule, some form of liability coverage or uh, adherence to certain standards and expectations. Perhaps I'm dictating how you use my truck, when you use my truck, things that you can or cannot do when you use it, when you pick it up, when you drop it off. All of those other factors are now going to pile up and start to strongly suggest employee status rather than independent status. So if, if I don't own the truck, can I be an independent contractor? Perhaps if you've got some other aspect that like a lease agreement or a, a purchase to own agreement or something where the independent contracting party has some financial cost and skin in the game, so to speak. And if I total the truck, it's on my insurance. It's on my dime rather than the company that is leasing or provided me the vehicle. So, I don't have to necessarily own my vehicle, but I do think other indicators have to support that that financial aspect, that the the risk of doing business is borne by the independent contractor rather than the employer. Because if I'm the employer and I provide my driver a truck and, and he or she totals a truck, that's on my insurance. The employee walks away. And if that's what happens when we say it's an independent contractor situation, then that completely contradicts independent status. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, you know, just kind of looking through and thinking through those eleven factors, you know, and, and thinking how um, trucking companies typically operate, even when they have somebody that leases onto them, it becomes really hard if you don't own the truck to really be able to take all the other factors and shift that scale far enough to the uh, independent contractor side to be able to label that person and treat them as an independent contractor. Because you know, typically if somebody's working for you and hauling loads for you, even if they own the truck, you're still covering the liability insurance. You're still in, you know, over the safety and you have to make sure the vehicle's still maintained because all those you know, things that you do affect your safety rating. So if, if the truck gets pulled into a port, gets inspected and has a bad inspection, that's still going to go against the trucking company's records. Exactly. So there's just, it, there's a lot that with, with you, the trucking company owning the truck, there's a lot that comes along with those additional factors kind of get married into that. And I, I was just going to kind of say, it, it's making me think we've got 11 factors here that we're talking about. And what you're saying is it's not like Oh, I scored six out of 11. I'm good. Uh, some may be weighted more heavily than others. Is that right? Not necessarily, no. They are. We look again at the, the, the relationship as a whole, and generally we don't place greater emphasis to any one of these oh, factors. It's, again, a totality of the circumstances. Okay. Now, you, you alluded to something earlier on, Chris, about the being somewhere in the middle and the risk associated with that. 
for me, the middle is like straddling a fence. If, if you've ever done that, it's not a comfortable experience. <laughs> and so if you're not in the purpose. middle, yeah, yeah, well, it, you're there. Um, if you're doing that in this type of a situation, you might get lucky and the the adjudicating party, like the unemployment division or the IRS, they may say, okay, you're far enough to the side, you've got an independent contractor status. But that no man's land in the middle is where the most risk, I think, occurs because it's hard to predict what an individual, like an investigator, a person, is going to determine based on their interpretation of the circumstances. We can make all the arguments we want, but at the end of the day, that investigator is going to make a conclusion, and that may disagree with what we've argued, and therefore you lose. So the goal, again, is to peg that to the farthest side of the scale. If you're really shooting for an independent contractor status, tie it off nicely. Make sure it's all the way as far as we can get it, understanding that maybe not everything will be, and that's okay, but predominantly most of the factors are. Right. And you can go, if you are if you have a question you don't understand or you don't know, say you, you think you're kind of close to the middle and, and it's you're in that gray area, you can go to your state agencies and you can go to even parts of the federal government, right, and ask their opinion, say, this is how I'm operating. I want it, your opinion whether I'm legally operating as independent contractors correct what what if i mean you could do that but what if they come back and say no now you're screwed well then yeah but it's better to know up front than to get caught in the back (laughs) and once it's already happened right so two questions there to your first question yes most agencies i don't practice in front of the irs so i i don't know if you can get a um like a a confidential or a risk-free opinion I, i don't know if the irs does that but some state agencies do Uh, Some federal agencies do, and I can, in an anonymous way, so to speak, most of these are done typically by a representative like an attorney who reaches out to the agency and says, here's what my client has going on, and I'm not going to tell you who my client is, but I'm giving you this information for the purposes of advising my client and making sure that we do it correctly. Here are the factors. Here's the situation. What do you think? And then the agency says, yay or nay, up or down, here's where we think you're short, here's where we think you're good. And then you can take that information and adjust accordingly. Now, if you do that and you do get an opinion back that says, yeah, you're not really an independent contractor, but you continue to operate as an independent contractor, now what you potentially have is a willful violation, meaning you knew it, you knew you were wrong, but you continue to do it anyway. And in some instances, penalties can be increased for that because you now are willfully or intentionally in violation of the law and you've been advised that you're doing it wrong. When you talk about penalties, uh, we're talking financial penalties? Absolutely. Okay, all right. Yeah. So no, nobody's going to jail here? Generally not. Okay. I'm aware of. <laughs> but can I, can I speak to that though yeah. for a sec, Craig? Because we, we, talk, we talked earlier on about why would someone do this? Why would an, an employer designate someone as an independent contractor? Well, because there's a 20 to 40% haircut right off the top of the cost of doing business with that individual. And you're saving taxes, federal and state. You're, you're eliminating workers' compensation insurance. You're eliminating unemployment insurance. There's a whole ton of stuff that you've just shaved right off the top of the relationship. And that goes to your bottom line as the employer instead of to a taxing agency for insurance or for taxes. That's the benefit for the employer. For the employee, the independent contractor, I have a tax write-off. I can claim those things as business expenses. The challenge, though, is from a federal agency like the IRS or a state taxing agency, they've lost revenue, and that's bad for a taxing agency. Uh, For employees, they have protected statuses that fall under federal and state laws. And so an independent contractor won't have those protections. So those agencies have something to say about that. If it's really not an independent contractor relationship, then you should be abiding by these types of no harassment, no discrimination, those types of of laws. And you're not. So then you come to the financial piece. And this is what I think is interesting and, and gets to the risk really that an organization has to confront if they want to designate an independent contractor. If I've not withheld taxes 
if I've not paid my unemployment, if I've not paid my workers' comp, if I've not paid the IRS, if I've not paid the state taxing agency, if I've not properly paid wages because it's uh, an hourly with overtime situation, those obligations are all still there. Just because I didn't withhold them, if it's later discovered that I've misclassified this employee, this individual as an independent contractor, but he or she is really an employee, all of that financial liability is now mine to pay. And some of those will have penalties on top of the amounts owed. So the risk, if you're caught, can be pretty high, especially when these agencies start sharing information in an audit like the IRS shares it with other agencies or the unemployment division shares it with other state agencies. And pretty soon you're dealing with multiple agencies all asking for money. Wow. Okay. So yeah. Is it just money? Yeah. Could it be a lot of money? Yeah. Sounds like. Okay. So where do we want to go from here, Chris? What, uh, what next question do you want to tackle? So as far as consequences go, that's kind of, you've, you've basically outlined that, right? That's if you, if you don't, if, if you, improperly labeled somebody as an independent contractor and they're not, um, there's just a bunch of financial consequences for having made that decision. So let's talk, I, I've got a list of about four things here that I think are some of the steps that you can take that, that really help slide that scale towards the independent contractor. Um, some, so in the trucking industry, one um, is to use an independent contractor agreement. That'll help. Like to, an actual contract, an actual a paper contract, contract. Yeah. So, written contract and then the the person that's an independent contractor it'll it helps if they actually register as a business entity right set up an llc or set up a corporation they have to get an ein number with that oftentimes they're gonna have to provide if not all of their own insurance at least part of their own insurance Um, they'll have to get a work comp waiver like you talked about or provide their own workers compensation insurance then uh the third one would be provide their own equipment so that you know, owning that truck, that's a big, because they're owning that truck also means there's a lot of other, a couple of those other factors that typically kind of go hand in hand with it. So if they own their truck, that, that helps. And then, you know, it's just, I guess it's always important to document everything so that you kind of cross your T's, dot your I's. And yeah, as to the employment, the, the independent contractor agreement, there is a, a misunderstanding that we commonly confront and that is well we have an agreement two parties independently agreed and said this is what we think the situation is in most instances here in utah for example that agreement doesn't control it's an important factor to consider but just because again these two parties said this is an independent contractor relationship doesn't mean that the unemployment division or the wage and hour group is going to agree it's just a factor that we will consider it's not controlling So it's good to have it, and you should, because within that agreement, you are identifying risks and liabilities and then allocating those appropriately amongst the parties based on the the relationship and and just the the negotiations. But it certainly doesn't dictate the outcome. So, Chris, let's make it personal. Okay, (laughs) so you were recently on the hunt for an employee, and you decided, it seems early on in the process, that you wanted to go for an employee, right? Mike, your driver is an employee of Holland Assets, not an independent contractor. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So, so, I, so I, what, what made you point yourself toward that instead of the independent contractor? Because everything I'm hearing here says, try to get an independent contractor because you can save a bunch of money. Um, but you decided to go the other way. Tell me why. A lot, a lot of it is just because he doesn't own the truck. And I, and I, you know, in my opinion, I think it's really hard to because there's so many other ramifications like I've talked about that come along with owning that truck because he doesn't own the truck. I own the truck. I control the maintenance. I control, um, the, you know, how it operates. I kind of tell him when and where to go. It just looking through those factors and the, and those tests. Um, I just feel like you can't really label that driver. I don't feel comfortable labeling him as an independent contractor. Now, someday down the road, I may lease guys onto my motor carrier authority. So, they bring their own truck, they lease under my authority. You know, I still control some of those aspects, but I think in that situation, once you do that, it becomes a lot easier to be able to defend 
that it's an independent contractor relationship. I just think when they don't own the truck, it's really it gets really hard to be able to to at the best case scenario, in my opinion, you're straddling the fence. So yeah. it can kind of go either way. Very good. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think too, from the employer, the owner of the truck's perspective, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in that piece of equipment, which I want to be taken care of regularly, scheduled, treated appropriately. And because of those expectations, I'm going to require certain things at certain times be done in certain ways. And all of those are going to look and feel like an employee relationship. So I, I agree. Yeah. Good. So it's not impossible, but it would be really tough to not own the truck and yet be an independent contractor. So with that being said, and just trying to wrap this all up yeah. really quick, um, as an attorney, when you advise clients, you're you're ultimately not the decision maker on this, right? You you advise them, you tell them where they're going to be, but ultimately it, the business owner is the one that makes the decision. If they want to assume the risk to classify as somebody as an independent contractor, I mean, you've you've kind of done your job, wash your hands, clean of it. You've told them what they you think they should do, but that doesn't mean they necessarily have to do it. I completely agree. In, in fact, when I hang up the phone after a call like that. I often have no idea what actually happens. And if the company receives a claim, typically that's when we would get involved again because now we, we need to try and defend that. Um, but my role and what, what I like about my role in this instance is I'm not paid to make the decision for the organization. I'm paid to advise what the risks are, what the rules of the game are, and paint what those potential consequences, the pros and the cons look like, and then step away and let the owner or the CEO or whoever make the decision about how they want to run their business based on their tolerance for risk. Because if there's a claim, it doesn't land on my desk. I'm not responsible for it. It's the company. Yeah. So ultimately, um, if, if somebody listening has any questions and doesn't know how they want to classify their employees or their independent contractors, it's probably best to talk to an attorney, get that attorney level advice, and then use that to help make what decision you feel is best for your company and the risk you're willing to take. You mean we're not just going to give everybody a one size fits all answer in this podcast, Chris? <laughs> Imagine that. What are we here for anyway? <laughs> we're not very helpful, are <laughs> yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. Well, sorry. Yeah, so. attorneys were needed in situations like this. We can be useful. And really what you would be looking for if a business is trying to make that analysis, talk to an employment law attorney. This is a key aspect of what we do. And we're looking at, again, a variety of these tests. And you get the benefit of the attorney-client relationship, which means if you've done it wrong and you tell that to me, I don't have to share that with anybody else, nor do you. And there's some privilege associated with that. So yeah, talk to an attorney get good advice, and then make your decision. So I can't go talk to my uh, divorce attorney that I've used four times to ask that question to? Uh, you could talk to a divorce <laughs> attorney and, and you're going to get what a divorce attorney thinks, which may or may not be what an employment law attorney thinks. I haven't been divorced four times. <laughs> not not once yet. Well, now you've got me thinking of, of whether I should be classifying my wife and kids as employees or independent contractors. What exactly is our relationship here? Uh, okay, so I, th I feel like we actually, we had a really good stopping point and then we made a couple jokes and, and we missed it, <laughs> but, uh, but there we go. So, uh, Chris, you feel like we've wrapped this up or do you have any final thoughts I, you want to share? No, I think that's good. Okay. I, I feel good about it. Good. So if anybody has any further questions, of course, like I say, most weeks nowadays, go find us on Facebook, go to Holland assets, Holland assets, LLC.com. Check out the show notes where you can leave comments, um, and, uh, and put those questions there. Now keep in mind, we're not lawyers. So, you know, we might be able to add a few tidbits here or there, but if you do have serious legal questions, then absolutely consult an attorney about that. But we're happy to, to follow up this discussion if anybody has any other uh, questions or comments in those places. So we hope to see you there. We love seeing the comments. Make sure you are subscribed and that you, uh, that you recommend the show to your friends uh, who are also out there on the road or thinking about uh, starting a, a trucking company and leave those reviews if you like what we do. If you find this helpful and you doggone it this was a helpful episode <laughs> listen to it again this is helpful stuff if you find this helpful go leave a five-star review wherever you listen to your podcast we would really appreciate it 
So, Ryan, thank you so much. You're welcome. For coming in. It was uh, it was very educational and, and very helpful. Uh, Chris, yeah. I guess I will see you next week. What's we'll coming up next week? Uh, we're going to talk more hiring a driver, a little bit more about the nuts and bolts and the actual process of doing it. The actual how-to. All yeah. right, we'll see you all then. Yeah.